take a look at the fourth component of the hydrological cycle, and this is infiltration. Now, infiltration is the process by which water soaks into or is absorbed by the soil. Now, there's several factors that affect infiltration. This includes the duration of the rainfall. Um, basically, the longer the, rain, the rainfall, the more water you're going to have. Soil porosity, meaning that uh, the, the soil grains, the sand grains that are actually close together or not so close together, those allow, if it's uh, a very porous, it allows more water to come through. If it's not very porous at all, then not, not a lot of water will come through there. Raindrop size, the bigger the rain, of course, you have larger raindrops. Pre-existing soil mo moisture, right now with all the rains we've had in Florida, uh, our soil is very, very uh, jam-packed with water. That's very super saturated. Vegetation cover and slope angle. Infiltration capacity, and this is another term to remember, and this is the maximum rate at which rain can be absorbed by a soil in a given condition. So imagine all the rain falling, and it reaches a certain point where only so much water can be absorbed through a certain amount of time. And so this is the capacity. Um, so in this graph, it actually shows you infiltration rate curves. And this is showing you three different types of rain. Uh, I'm sorry, not rain. Three different types of soil. We have sandy loam, loam, and clay loam. And if you notice, um, over on the left-hand side, at basically zero time, um, at the time of the rain, we have the largest amount of infiltration rate, meaning that the soil can absorb a lot of water as it's raining or as, it's pre uh, as the precipitation is happening. But notice as time goes on that the infiltration rate sort of levels off. Now infiltration is inversely related to overland flow or surface runoff. So basically, this means that the more overland flow we have, the less infiltration you're going to have. So they're inversely related. As one goes up, the other will go down. Now there's two types of overland flow that we're going to discuss here. The first is something called Hortonian flow, or infiltration excess flow. Now when rainfall intensity exceeds infiltration capacity, meaning that when it's too fast, basically the rainfall is happening too fast for the infiltration to happen, water runs straight off the surface. Now this usually occurs in arid or semi-arid environments, so really dry to semi-dry environments that this happens. We also have something called saturated overland flow. And this is pretty much what happens a lot here in Florida. And you can see this with all the rain that we've had over the summer. You can see a lot of this, uh, these particular stores of water. So saturated overland flow is when the infiltration capacity is greater than rainfall intensity. Stores of water will fill before overland flow occurs. So in this case, we have infiltration capacity is much greater. So the uh, water is being absorbed in the soil faster than it's raining, basically. So stores of water underneath the ground will actually fill, or above ground for that matter, will fill before overland flow occurs. Now this often happens in humid environments. So uh, places like Florida, this will happen a little bit more in. That is not to say that we can't have infiltration excess flow. Our soil tends to get much more saturated first before that overland flow occurs. Now soil moisture is one of those components as well. Now soil moisture is the subsurface water in the soil. So it's not the stuff that lies directly on top of the surface, but just below it. Now we have field capacity, and this is the amount of water held in the solid, oops, I'm sorry, held in soil, and there's a typo, after excess water drains away. And this is called saturation. So your textbook uses field capacity and that's the same thing as saturation. We have something called wilting point. Now this is the range of moisture content in which permanent wilting of plants occur. Um, let's say for instance um, we have a lot of water or even not a lot of water at all. So this is that range moisture or the range of moisture content. Um, if we don't have a lot of moisture in a particular area then we're gonna see permanent wilting of plants. If there's a lot of moisture, 
then we won't see that wilting point. We have something called through flow, and again, if you just sort of break up this word, it will help you understand what the definition is. Now, this is the water which flows through the soil in natural pipes, or those natural pipes are basically just the natural paths that go through the soil. And then we have something called percolines. Now these are lines of concentrated water flow between soil horizons. Now just to sort of sum up what a soil horizon is, if you were to look at a side of, um, let's say a soil, um, a soil section, you'd actually be able to tell the different types of soil that are in that section. And a lot of times we see these concentrated lines of water between these sections of different types of soil. So in your head, if you can picture, um, let's say we had a red type soil. Underneath it, we had more of a brown type. And then underneath that brown type, we had more of a really dark black type. Usually in between those colors, we would see a concentrated water flow. And that's just because of the type of soil is usually different. If you see a different color soil, it usually means that it's a different soil altogether. It might have different components in it. The last and final component of the hydrological cycle is groundwater. Now groundwater is really important because this is the subsurface water that's usually found within a few hundred meters of the surface. A lot of times, and ex again especially here in Florida, we use the groundwater as wells. We, we get our well water from these particular places. So groundwater is extremely important to places that don't necessarily have um, maybe city water. A lot of people have wells here in Florida. Percolation. This is a term and that means that the water which moves slowly downward from the soil into the bedrock and basically what happens it sort of um, is dependent upon the permeability of the rock. As this water percolates down, as it's dripping if you will, dripping down from the soil surface down through the soil, a lot of times it actually gets cleansed and you'll hear a lot of, um, we'll see some terms like aquifers a little bit later. And those clean water stores actually are very important for um, water bottling companies and again, well water. This is very clean water in these particular aquifers. We also have something called base flow. And again, this is a flow. So this is the part of a river's discharge that is provided by groundwater seeping into a bed of a river. So if we were, let's say, to take a look at um, this picture, and here's your stream, this is your river, just a smaller river. Base flow is actually coming out of um, this water table. So it's coming out of this section of soil right here, and it's actually streaming back into this river or stream. It's also another word for leakage, if you will. We also have these two words, and you're going to see them differently depending upon the source that you look at. Our textbook uses one type, um, and some other textbooks use a different word, so that's why I have both. We have here something called the phreatic zone, also known as the zone of saturation. Now this is the permanently saturated zone within solid rocks and sediments. So your zone of saturation is usually a little bit further down and this is permanently saturated. It's got tons of water here within solid rocks and sediments and all the little bits of soil that might be down here. We also have something called the Vados zone. Now this is the zone of aeration. This is the zone between the surface and the water table. So in our diagram here, we have over on the left, we have this Vado zone. We have the surface here, and right along the edge is our zone of aeration. This is a zone that separates the soil from the rest of that water table, which is the zone of, of saturation. So that's your zone of aeration right along that surface there. So in this picture, we have a couple zones of aeration. We can see them here. Pretty much what's in dark blue down here, that's the zone of saturation with the little arrows pointing and showing you all these places, like all the stuff's going into the lake. Some of this is going down deep into the zone of saturation. So this is all your base flow in here. 
Now an aquifer, as I was mentioning before, this is pretty important, especially in Florida. We, we have a lot of aquifers in Florida because of our limestone that we carry underneath the surface. Now aquifers are permeable rocks, such as limestone or sandstone, that contain significant quantities of water. Now these are extremely important because again, we get our water, we can get some well water from these places. They also might um, actually form springs. So where we have water leaking at the surface, we might have some springs, which are very clean water. And a lot of times, like Zephyr Hills, you hear that um, our Zephyr Hills water actually gets its spring water from um, an aquifer, from this area of leakage that has leaked to the surface. So we have many springs here in Florida that actually are very clean water, and um, it's very drinkable. It's very good. These aquifers are very, um, very good for the hydrological cycle, especially if they're allowed to leak back. Now, this term recharge, you'll hear this a lot as well. Now, this is the refilling of water through pores where water has dried up or extracted for human use. So let's say we tap into one of these aquifers and we use up all the water. Well, that water might have been kind of old. It might have been there for hundreds or thousands of years. So the recharge rate on that particular aquifer will be kind of slow. So recharge is really important, especially around Florida, because if we're taking a lot of our water out of these aquifers and out of, out of the water table, the groundwater stores, we need a way to refill it up. And that's what recharge does. So whenever it rains, we're hoping that those, those stores of water are recharged. This is the recharge of groundwater. Now the recharge of groundwater results of the infiltration of some uh, precipitation on the surface. So that's one way that recharge happens. The leakage through beds and banks of surface water coming back up from, actually instead of coming up into the stream, it actually leaks down into the groundwater store. Groundwater leakage and inflow from surrounding rocks and aquifers. So we get recharge into the aquifers from the surrounding groundwater. And artificial recharge from reservoirs, dams, irrigation, or other th things that humans have actually done. One of the main reasons why we create these little retention ponds around new construction is for this purpose. So there's an area of recharge. Now this is um, just, I took this slide and this is just a, um, a picture showing you the Midwest and around Oklahoma, New Mexico, Colorado. And if you think about this area, it's really high amounts of agriculture in this particular area. So the losses of groundwater result a lot from, in this particular area, human activity. So we have evapotranspiration where water table is close to the surface, so basically the water is being evaporated away. The natural discharge by spring flow and leakage to surface water bodies, so the groundwater leaks into those rivers and those lakes and things. Groundwater leakage and outflow from water from aquifers, so that water is actually leaving the aquifer, and artificial abstraction. And in this particular area um, of the Midwest here in the United States, all of this particular land is being, uh, all the groundwater stores are highly affected. Everything in red is basically, um, we have a lot of, um, a lot of loss from the groundwater. So all this red, orange, and uh, yellow areas, these are all places where groundwater stores are very, very low. So we have to be very careful about how much water we actually pull out of these groundwater stores.